worship service. Let's stand to our feet as we go before our King. He is our God and He loves us so much and He's done such a great miracle. Amen. And so we are here to worship Him and to give Him praise and honor for what He has done. He is risen, everyone. Yes. Praise God. Let's put our hands together. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. Amen. And so as we're going before our King to worship Him, let's go before Him with praise and thanksgiving in prayer. Are you? Father God, we come before your throne. Lord, you are good. And you are greatly to be praised, oh God. We come before you knowing that we have nothing of and by ourselves good. But Father, you have created us, even though fearfully and wonderfully made. You have made us to house you. You have made us that we can hold you, Holy Spirit. And so, Father, it is with this miracle that you've given it to us, Father, on this sense with thanksgiving and honor. And so, Father, we just come now and we lay every weight before your throne, oh God, right at your feet, for you are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the great I am. You are the one who has given us life. And so, Father, we confess before you our sins. We know, oh God, that you are faithful to forgive. And so, Father, we say, forgive us, oh Lord. So God, we just come before you, thanking you and blessing you for what you do. We thank you, Lord, in this great name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Everybody say amen. 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 He is worthy. Amen. Let's praise him. Amen. 
into the cleft of the rock and he will hide us in plain sight. We can be with his alive. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one.
handed over. How many times we have been betrayed, oh Lord, you have experienced that. And how many times have we sacrificed our lives for something? But Father, the ultimate sacrifice that you gave and you gave your son, we can stand before you and say, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your sacrifice. And now we're raised. And in the word it says, we're seated in heavenly places. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. They still did not understand. 
understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. Sunday. It's a blessing to see all of you here this morning. Such a joy to celebrate the, the Easter. The resurrection is like the Super Bowl for the Christian faith, isn't it? There's nothing else more important than the resurrection. Because the Bible tells us if, if Christ is not risen, then we're dead in our sins. And we're of all, thank you baby. love and his acceptance with our human conditional love and in celebration of Easter and the resurrection of our Lord. The call to worship, it recounts God's steadfast love and assures readers of God's constancy even when circumstances are difficult and maybe even our own fault. We've all been there, haven't we? Acts 10 tells of one of the times that God transformed Peter's mind and Help him to see that tradition had to be changed when love demanded it. 1 Corinthians 15, it reminds us of Paul's transformation, who went around as a murderer of God's people to a leader and a preacher of the good news. What Easter is truly all about. Not eggs and rabbits, and nothing against eggs and rabbits and the fun of children playing during this time, but, but the true focus is is this, for I deliver to you of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sin. Love shows up. But we're not looking for God sometimes in our own minds when we've turned our back on God. God shows up. Let us pray. Loving Father, we come before your throne in the mighty strong name of Jesus. We thank you for your love and your mercy, for your grace and your compassion. We thank you for your unconditional love. We thank you for loving us before we were even born. We thank you for friends and family that you bring into our lives and help us to experience your love more fully. And we thank you so much more than anything for giving your son, Jesus Christ, that died for us and who lives for us. And we thank you, God, for the blessing of just who you are. Lord, I ask that you move me out of the way with my misunderstandings, with my opinions, with my shortcomings, that whatever would separate the message that you have for your people, Lord, move it out of the way so that you alone, Lord God Almighty, will be magnified. And you alone, Lord God Almighty, will be glorified. Or you say you will share your glory. We've heard her a lot of different things, but before meeting Jesus, the text of Scripture tells us that she suffered with seven demons. Whether it was possession or infirmity, her suffering was real and intense. We don't know how long it lasted, maybe years, we don't know. All we know from Scripture is that one day she meets Jesus. One day her pain, one day her frustration, one day her agony, all the demons were gone and her life was changed forever. We all have our demons, don't we? And only God working through us can set us free from them. Our past hurts, our, our pains, our, our sins, our 
Yes. The demons get rooted in and they seek to destroy every joy and success that could be a part of our lives. The good things that God desires for us, those demons, some that we even want to hold on to because we've lived with them for so long, slowly draining the life and joy that God desires. But God in his grace and his mercy. And so today we encounter a woman at the tomb of Jesus. But just who was Mary Magdalene? Who is this weeping, distraught woman at the tomb of Jesus? Let's give a little background information. For many centuries, the most obsessively revered of saints, she became the embodiment of Christian devotion. It was divine as repentance. Yet in scripture, she's kind of elusively identified in scripture, but she served as an individual onto which a succession of ideas and stories have been projected. One age after another, her, her image is reinvented. In some ages, she's called a prostitute, and others an immoral woman, and others a mystic, and others a celibate nun, to others a passive helpmeet, to a feminist icon, to the matrix of divinity's secret dynasty. How the past is remembered, how desire is domesticated, how men and women negotiate their separate impulses, how power inevitably seeks sanctity of Galilee. She was a leading figure among those attracted to Jesus that came. And when the men in that company, when they abandoned Jesus at his hour of mortal danger, guess what? Mary of Magdala, she was one of the women who stayed with him, even to the crucifixion. She was present at the tomb, the first person to whom Jesus appeared after his resurrection, and the first to preach the great news of that miracle to the other disciples. These are among the few specific things that we find about Mary Magdalene in the Gospels. From the other texts in the early Christian era, it seems that her status was that even up. In the years after Jesus' death, it rivaled even that of Peter, the prominence derived from the intimacy of her relationship with Jesus and the deep closeness with which they share. If we look at the threads of these few statements in the early Christian records that date all the way through the first through the third centuries. It leads to this portrait of Mary of Magdalene. It's interesting that she was considered. People like to bring up people's past of negativity and use it in the wrong way. But when we look through scripture, I find something really interesting. God uses the most unlikely heroes, doesn't he? He uses them to work through his power the most amazingly. He takes a little shepherd boy and slays a giant, and he leads a nation. He takes a stuttering murderer, disgraced heir to the Egyptian throne, and uses him to lead a nation to freedom. He takes the prostitute Rahab, used by God, to save the entire nation of Israel from destruction. She later marries the leader and part of the lineage of, the, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ unlikely heroes in the story of life. But they all have something in common. And we'll see as we go through this passage this morning. They realize something that we celebrate at Easter today. And it's something that I feel and I pray that we will keep into our minds and hearts. And it's not just a message that we moved from the tomb. Mary went to the tomb when it was still dark. And in a time when society viewed women as second-class citizens, the Bible reveals the true reality, her fearlessness, her boldness, and her determination. The other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their home. You know, it's interesting because the very first news of Easter was not good news at all, was it? It was in a sense for Mary Magdalene, it was terrible news that Jesus who had fed 5,000, who raised the dead, who had healed, who had set free, who had loved unconditionally, who was beaten and spit upon and crucified, they had witnessed all of this, but now his body was missing. And so it was tragic news to Mary Magdalene that she brought to the apostles, Peter and John, and when she came running with the announcement that the body of Jesus had disappeared. It was an indication that at the moment that even they didn't believe what Jesus was saying all along. 
But it was a shock to them when they came and they found the empty tomb. It wasn't easy to get into those tombs. In 1876 in the United States, there was an attempt made to steal the body of Abraham Lincoln. They were going to steal the body of Abraham Lincoln, and then they were going to hold it for ransom. The entire nation was shocked and dismayed, but the, foil, the, the plot was foiled, and the criminals, they were all captured and imprisoned, and the, the body was reburied in Springfield, Illinois, in a coffin encased in a steel cage, in of country. Why do I share this story? Because of the popularity surrounding Jesus, they put a stone in front of his grave that weighed between 2,000 and 4,000 pounds. Nothing that somebody could just roll away and go and snatch a, a body. And so we can imagine the shock of the disciples of Jesus when they were smitten and they were numb as they already were after seeing their friend and their savior crucified. But when they heard Mary's hysterical, roll the stone away. But Mary, she left the other women there and she ran to tell Peter and John that the tomb had been robbed, the guard had left, and the body of Jesus had disappeared. According to the other gospels, the other women stayed. Mary had not yet received the news when she ran to tell Peter and John about the disappearance of the body of Jesus. And so here we have Peter and John running through the streets of Jerusalem, going through the Damascus gate to the tomb. John, the younger of the two, he outran Peter. He stooped down. He looks into the tomb. Here's Mary. She's running through the streets to the disciples. The disciples run. John doesn't go in, but he looks in and he sees the linen wrappings. Peter goes into the tomb. He sees that the cloth that covered Jesus' head was rolled up and placed to the side. John apparently saw that as significant, and the scene caused one disciple to believe. They may not have realized it, but Jesus had risen from the dead. The light was beginning to break through. If Jesus isn't risen, we're wasting our time. We shouldn't even be here. If Jesus isn't risen, if, if these stories of the documented accounts of what happened with Jesus and the resurrection, if they are real, then why are we even here? And when they went home, whether they knew it or not, at some point in time, they were going to see because Jesus goes right through the walls and they see the risen Jesus Christ in the flesh. It says, but Mary, she stood weeping outside the tomb. The men go back to home. Here's Mary. She's weeping outside of the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting One at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Her intense grief is a part of the human experience, isn't it? We all experience loss. How many of you have experienced loss before? You don't even have to raise your hand. We, we all have experienced loss before, haven't we? And he redeems it for his glory. He takes every part of our lives, every hurt, every pain, every abuse, every suffering, and he weaves it into the beautiful tapestry of our lives to create what he desires for our lives to be. There's nothing that's lost that God can't restore in his own way, in his own timing, when we trust him and believe. The promise and the reality that no matter where you are right now, the word that God is saying to you is this. I'm pleased with you. You're never alone and you never will be. And at least expect me to show up. I'm going to be right there with you. You see, Jesus was a teacher and a friend to Mary. She was one of the disciples traveling with Jesus, supporting the ministry, serving the people. She was healed and her life was transformed forever. So it's no surprise to see Mary there weeping at the tomb of Jesus. We notice that four or five times, and four times actually. But notice when Jesus calls her name, she is able to see him for who he is. When he calls her name, no, initially she looks and she sees 
Oh, is it, it's the gardener. But when he calls her name, she's able to see him as he is. And maybe God is calling your name this morning. And you can see him and his call in a way like never before. A lot of people have the wrong view of God. None of us have an understanding of the God who created infinite universes. And some people see God as an angry old man sitting up in the sky, beating you up every time you slip and fall. And that's not the God of Scripture. He's not the impersonal universe. He's not impersonal and uncaring. He's not the big guy upstairs. He, he's God, the creator of infinite universes, creator of by God. Yes. He's the only way that we can become whole, and he's the only way that we can flourish in life. He, he's the only way that we can have a healthy, happy relationship, because without God, guess what? I'm the craziest man on the face of the earth. But sometimes we have a distortion of God because of our own experiences. How we grew up, the things we saw, and how others have behaved, even towards us. And since we're all flawed and imperfect, we're just so thankful that every day that we live, we recognize this true reality that I only live and move and breathe and have my being. I only have joy in my life. I only, the only way I try to even stay on the right path is by the grace of God. His amazing grace. It's only his grace that moves us to desire to please him. It's only his grace that moves us to live a life that, that wants to please him. Revolution. He came to start a revelation, a relationship with the triune God. A relationship where there's no go-between between, between God and you. No pastor, no, 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 no preacher, no, no evangelist, no bishop, no prophet, no one. There's nothing between you and God. You can go straight to the Father through Jesus Christ. And so Jesus came to, to help us experience through the resurrection a living, breathing, intimate relationship with God himself. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit God who came when he lives in us. That he gives us a whole new way of thinking. A whole new way of living, a new way of being, a new way of seeing ourselves. Because how we see ourselves is always going to dictate how we treat other people. Well, no, I, I feel good about myself. I, I feel great, but if I'm treating other people with, with disrespect and if I'm treating other people a certain way, it only is saying chaff. It was a way of life. It was a way that loved, that, that loved, and that respected, that was unselfish, that cared for others. It was a way that could, that could see other people that were in need and, and would love them unselfishly, as selfish as we are. It was a way of seeing other people and, 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 and seeing ourselves through God's eyes of grace and not through society's eyes or even our family's eyes. It was the way of seeing ourselves through God's eyes of love and unconditional acceptance. It was a way of transformation. You see, the resurrection is transformation, isn't it? It's not the same body that's resurrected. It's a different body. And God, when he comes to live in us, he transforms our thinking, which transforms our lives, which transforms our behavior, which transforms our relationship. And we find that every aspect of our lives is being transformed. It's a way that God says that in order to gain your life, you're going to have to lose it. It's a way of giving and not just taking it. Reward of eternity is worth it. And it's not just the reward for eternity. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give you life more abundantly. So Jesus is not saying I'm just, just for eternity life, eternal life. He's saying if you have when you have a relationship with me, the God who knows everything about me, who knows the past, the present, and future, the one who can open and close any door from who every blessing flows. He says that that's the life when you relate with me. Yeah, it may be a, a, a narrow road. It may be difficult. But it is going to be an abundant life that you can't get anywhere else. And we've all tried to grab that life in other ways, haven't we? 
The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus says, I've come to give you new life. Receive it. The word of God goes on to say, but when she said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing her to be him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, eating with sinners and tax collectors and going to weddings. I got a feeling that Jesus probably did enjoy her, didn't he? <laughs> but she embraced him the way she usually did, it seems. But to our ears, Jesus saying, do not hold on to me because I'm not yet ascended to the Father. It may sound a bit cold, but Jesus was not telling Mary not to touch him. He was, he was saying he couldn't stay with her, that things were going to be different, that she would not be able to touch him physically just like we can't. But nevertheless, the message was Jesus was there to offer a new way of being and connecting with him. In the book of Acts, he promises that the Holy Spirit will come. Them that I will not only be with you, I will be in you. And so now Jesus takes his relationship with, with Mary and with all of humanity to a whole nother level. Yes, they could walk with Jesus. They could pat him on the back. They could hug him. But now he says, when I go to the Father, I'm going to send Holy Spirit who's going to live in you and be with you forever. And you will know that you are pleasing to me. You will know that you're never alone. And you will know the area of your life where he's calling your name. Because what God has to offer is always going to be better than what we try to hold on to. I don't know about you, but I've tried to hold on to other things. But it's like holding on to sand, isn't it? It just slips through our fingers. What God has to offer is something that's not only just good for this life, it's good for eternity. Because in God is everything good. And so on this Easter Sunday, what is God saying to you? How do we apply this to our everyday living at work, in our relationships, in the direction? that we're heading. I want to leave you this morning with just a few practical daily life applications. We recognize that we recognize that we all have stones that need to be rolled out of the way. When you get in the quiet time alone with God, he will speak to you so loud and he is never, you can't even hear the voice, but you feel it so deep in your soul that you know he's speaking to you. If there's a stone that needs to be rolled away in your life, you may think, it's, it's 2,000 pounds. How do I roll that stone away? <laughs> Jesus can roll a stone away of our life just like that. Sometimes it takes time for truth to sink in. We, sometimes we need to pummel the things in our heart like Mary did, the, the Mary, the mother of Jesus did, to consider the ways that God to work in our lives and sometimes we have to look with fresh eyes at other situations where God might be working with you and me that, and that we, maybe we dismissed them before because it was outside of our typical norm of how we normally used to doing things and we can sometimes limit God with our own views and, and we hold on and God is trying to move the stone away and we stand it in the way Let him move. We assume God works in our lives in prescribed ways and we forget he uses methods and people and experiences to teach us what he wants us to learn to take us to that amazing level of living. The unexpected God shows up. And he shows up sometimes when we least expect it. And so I encourage you this morning. Take the message that Jesus offers to you and me. We've been invited to the greatest relationship in the world. There is no greater relationship like the relationship with God. I love my wife from mind, heart, soul, and strength and being. I love my kids. But my first relationship has to be God. Because it's only God that tells me how to, how to love my wife. I don't always listen. 
but I try. <laughs> He's invited us to the greatest relationship in the history. Our little sister Monique saying that she, I have her permission to share this. You know, she 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 shared with us, and you all know her. She said she said that she literally thought that she could not see beyond her life. She said she could not see her life as anything more than a girl who had been cast aside by her family and that she, maybe I'm just going to be a stripper for the rest of my life. And then one day, unbeknownst, God spoke to her and opened up her heart, opened up her mind. Now when you see her with her four little children and her husband, it just fills your heart with joy, not for anything that we did, but what God did when she could hear him call her name. And we all have our own situation, but God is calling our names this morning. So it's even good things that will say, God, your love is not with me anymore. It will never, ever leave you. And that's the invitation that he has. It's not an invitation to try to stretch you, make you frustrated. It's an invitation for abundant life. This upcoming week, we all have some, probably some serious things going on in our lives. Some fears, some hopes, some dreams. But the good news of Jesus is that you don't have to face anything alone. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and I will live with him and he will live with me. Maybe he's knocking on our door this morning. It's a promise that the living just because he lives. And so I invite you this morning say yes to God, yes. He's already said yes to you. To say yes and put your trust in God as Lord and Savior. To recognize God is not angry or upset or mad. He's, he's, it says he's not even counting our sins against us. He's not even holding them against us. He wants so much to have this personal relationship with you and me that he sent his son Jesus Christ, his only son, to shed his blood, to die on the cross, and to be raised from the dead. He did all that so you and me could be set free from the bondage of sin and the fear of death and enter into eternal life. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, that means you, me, everybody, Everybody, nobody left out. Everybody. And so we say, what you said in your word that if I acknowledge that you raised Jesus from the dead, then I, that, that I accept him as my Lord and Savior, I would be saved. So God, I now say that I believe you raised Jesus from the dead. And that he is alive and, and he gives me life. I realize that I have not lived my life to please you, God. Forgive me for my sins and give me a new view of you, a new view of myself, and a new view of others. I accept Jesus now as my personal Lord and Savior. I accept my salvation from sin right now and the gift of eternal life in Jesus' name. Receive it. Amen. 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 Always remember, and always share. God is pleased with you. You're never alone. And when you least expect God to show up, he is right there with you. This morning, we, the divine represents his blood. This could be a little tricky, so be careful. If you need one, just hold your hands. We have, a, we have a many of them, so we'll wait until everyone has one, and then we will celebrate it together as a family.
watching around the world, wherever you're watching, give you some time to get a piece of bread and some fruit juice or whatever it is you will take it with. And we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. What I received from the Lord, I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke Calvary. We receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you for this fruit of the vine that represents blood shed on Calvary. The blood will pierce through your hands and your feet and the spear was thrust through your side. The blood that cleanses us from all unrighteousness and sin and gives us new life in Christ. And so we receive it in the mighty strong name of Jesus and we thank you, Lord. Amen. But I've never had God not keep his promise. So when he says he's coming back, I may not even understand the full context of what all of that means, but guess what? He is coming back. Amen? He's coming back. And we're excited. We don't know when or how, but we do know that he is coming back. And with him is every victory that we need. Every victory in our lives.